How many Marines? <laughs> okay. Um, so this presentation, I, it, it's kind of a historical presentation as well as where we are today with the island of Iwo Jima. Okay. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to get your hand in the air. This is, I, I really want to educate people about what's going on with Iwo Jima because it is very, very important that we hold on to this island. It is not ours. The Japanese, we have to have permission to be there. Uh, most of the Iwo Jima veterans that served on Iwo back in 1945 are really not happy with the fact that, that it was given back to them. However, we, it's their island. So we had to give it back to them. Um, we do get one day a year for about eight hours, and that is it. Okay, so as we're going through this presentation, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask them. If I don't know it, I'll make something up, um, which is pretty much, I've had enough to drink to where I don't feel guilty about lying to you at this point. Okay, so first of all, Island was given back to the uh, Japanese in 1968. Like I said, it was kind of the right thing to do. It is their territory. Iwo Jima, which is now known as Iwo To, is like their Arlington Cemetery. <coughs> there were 22,000 Japanese soldiers that were stationed on and in the island during the battle. Less than 200 survived. Most of them, the vast majority of them, are down in the caves still. There are over 14 miles worth of tunnels down there. So back in the heyday, when I first got involved with this, when we were taking veterans back, you used to be able to go down into those tunnels. Because the island is, sh is constantly shifting, it is the most volcanic active island in the entire world. So there are times that we'll go, um, in the past, about, let me see, three years ago was the last time we were there. I'm sorry, four years ago when we were there, when we landed and I was standing on Green Beach, which is where the 5th Marine Division landed, if you look straight out, there was an island about a mile away that was bigger than Iwo Jima and Mount Saribachi. It was just this huge mountain that showed up out of the ocean. When we went back three years ago, it was gone. <coughs> So it had risen out of the, uh, the uh, ocean and then it just descended back in. Um, when we talked to the, uh, the, the pilots that were making that flight from Narita to Guam, they told us it was the weirdest thing you'd ever seen. For about two or three weeks, the ocean was literally boiling in that spot and then all of a sudden this island appeared. So it was very, very interesting. Um, during World War II, during the 1940s, and right now, the mayor of Tokyo is in charge of Iwo Jima. He was, so during 1941 through 45, when there were Japanese citizens that were living on the island, it was a small fishing village, the mayor of Tokyo was the mayor of Iwo Jima. Now, why do you think they changed the name of Iwo Jima? Because it's now Iwo To. Now, according to the Japanese, they say that they changed it back to the original name of the island, which means Sulphur Island. It's be religious or something spiritual. Has nothing to do with that. Really? We beat the Japanese on this island. Yeah, yeah. We called it Iwo Jima, wow. and so now it's Iwo To. Has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that. That was their spiritual island, though. It's, well, it, 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 it was a fishing village. <laughs> So, there, I don't want to dispute it, but it makes sense. Well, like I said, it's, it's their island. They get to call it what they want to. So this is what the island of Iwo Jima looked like back in 1945. There were three airstrips. This was Motoyama number one, number two, and this was number three. Motoyama number one was going to be a fighter base. We had to take this island, all right? Very, very small island. It's only four and a half miles wide. Uh, long, two and a half miles long. It is only about eight square miles. So it's very, very small. When we land on Iwo Jima today, we land on Motoyama number two, and everybody but the veterans have to provide their own transportation. So, I'm sorry? Yeah, I don't think your pointer is working. You, really, you might have to just point the screen. Right here. This is Motoyama number two. Okay. 
So when we land on Iwo Jima, um, every person except for the veterans have to walk. So we usually have a ceremony right down in this area here. This is where the 5th Marine Division Cemetery used to be. There's no Americans on there except for about 80 that are uh, missing in action. All right, most of them were probably killed off the, the landing beaches here. When we land, when you take off from Motoyama number two and you go to the top of Mount Sarabachi, come down, collect your sand, come back up, and then walk back to the uh, Motoyama number two, you're talking about a 10 mile hike. So um, it's not for the faint of heart. So, it, and, and as I'll show you, this is not sand along the, the landing beaches. There's no sand on the island. So the black sands of Iwo Jima is actually volcanic ash. And it's very, very porous. At one point, we had 75,000 Marines on this island. Couldn't get any more on there. All right, and keep in mind, when this whole thing started, we had 22,000 Japanese on there. We had no idea how many were actually on the island. The original estimates were about 13,000. They were thinking Iwo Jima would take about three days. So when we, when the Marines assaulted, and this was a joint operation. There was Coast Guard there, Navy, Army Air Corps, and there was U.S. Army there. So this was a complete joint operation. So, you know, as a Marine, we're always bragging about how we took Iwo Jima. This was a joint operation, okay? Um, this right here is Mount Sarabachi. It's the caldera on the end of the island. Everybody's very familiar because of the flag raising on Mount Sarabachi. If you want a frame of reference, Mount Sarabachi is about as tall as the Washington Monument, okay? When the, the Navy Seabees, when we secured the island, they actually built a road up to the top of, of Mount Sarabachi. That road is still there. That's how, that's how great these Navy Seabees were. When they built stuff, and I mean, there's volcanic eruptions happening all the time, and you'll have a space of like two feet, but that road is still there. So, a lot of people, um, anybody here ever taken any U.S. history classes on uh, World War II? It, and it, what is the prevalent theory on us going to Iwo Jima? Do you know, sir? Well, we had to have fighter protection. Right, we had, to, we had to do that because we had too many Japanese that were shooting down our, our long-range bombers. We could not support them. However, the, the, you know, all of these Monday morning quarterbacks now are saying, we could have skipped this island. We didn't have to have the casualties that we had. Well, we couldn't skip the island because in order to get to Japan and do our firebombing raids, we had to fly right over the Bonin Islands. Iwo Jima is right in the middle of that. So as a result of that, the fighter planes, they couldn't even make it to the Bonin Islands. They had to turn around in order to make it back to Guam, Saipan, and Tinian. So what ends up happening is these bombers, these long range bombers are on their own out there. So eventually what happens, I've, I've seen estimates of anywhere between 25,000 to 100,000 troops that were saved because we took the island of Iwo Jima. And it was a very, very heavy cost, as you'll soon find out. So for 74 straight days, the United States bombarded Iwo Jima by air, by sea. This is actually the battleship Missouri. Did you guys know that the first time that the, the battleship Missouri, everybody knows about the surrender, the first time this ship fired its gun in its anger, it was on Iwo Jima. So this was the very first Japanese homeland island that the battleship Missouri was actually firing at. There used to be a, a lot of people saying that um, the, t the two guns at the front of the ship were off the USS Arizona. That's not true. Um, USS Arizona, when that went down, they took both of those guns and they actually made it part of the, the island um, defense. And they put them up on one of them over by Diamond Head and they actually made this massive concrete pillar 
and then they bolted those guns down and they fired it for the first time and they cracked the entire gun. Because when, the, when these ships fire, it'll recoil, not so much diamond head. So, um, but so the first time that they fire this weapon, it is on Iwo Jima. It, it had served in some other campaigns, but the first time that it's actually supporting ground troops was on Iwo Jima. In order to fire one of these bullets, and that's exactly what these things are, this is one of the rounds off of the, um, the USS Missouri. They take, it's like a bale of black powder. It's about as big as a footstool. And it takes three of those to fire one of those bullets up to 25 miles. So this thing could sit off the coast of Iwo Jima and just pound. Now think about 74 days of air bombardment, 74 days of naval bombardment, they didn't kill a single Japanese. So as you look at this, you see all the red dots? Those are spider holes, entrances, Everything that the Japanese had built over the time period that General Karamashai Kurbayashi was there, that's exactly what they did. It was an absolute killing field. Every square inch of that island was covered in a cross section of fire. So as the Marines came up off of the landing beaches, as they came in, the way the island is set because of the tides, it's got three terraces. They come up, and on each terrace, the Japanese would put gun emplacements. This is Mount Saribachi, this is the rock quarry. So they already had them in a total crossfire there. And then they concealed all of these pillboxes and machine gun um, positions that were so well camouflaged when the Marines passed them, they didn't even see them. The first three waves came ashore, starting at like 9 a.m. in the morning, 0900 in the morning is when the first wave came ashore. The second wave came ashore about 9.30. By 10 hundred hours, all three waves were there. General Tadamasha Kurbayashi's plan was, do not fire around until I give you the, the message. As soon as the landing beaches were completely packed, that's when he opened up um, fire. Two out of every three Marines that was on the island at that point was a casualty. And there was no way to get them off. So now they've got an evacuation problem. So this was, you know, this was the first time the Japanese had actually used like caves. If you think about Guadalcanal, Tarawa, and all these other islands that the United States Marines had, had gone to in the island hopping campaign, it was a trench warfare kind of thing. The Japanese would dig a trench and they would stay put and they were depending on the fact that they had superior firepower and that they had these trench lines, they were gonna make the Marines pay. Well now, General Kurbayashi says, we're going underground and we're gonna fight them our way. So it's all guerrilla warfare. These, these Japanese were very well disciplined until about day 20 is when they really start committing suicide because they realize it's over. They're out of water, most of them don't have any food, and that's when their will started. They're like, hey, we gotta do what we gotta do. So, um, like I said, there's about 22,000 Japanese. General um, Kurbayashi's headquarters was up here at Katana Point so from this vantage point, he could see the entire island. The only part of the island that was not covered by tunnels is this section right here by the base of Mount Saribachi. If they would have had two more weeks, they would have connected the entire island. It would have changed the entire outcome of the, of the battle. This was an absolute brawl. We've never had this kind of casualties in American history that we had on Iwo Jima. Based on the casualties from Iwo Jima and then eventually Okinawa, we estimated our, our, um, our strategists figured out we would have over a million U.S. casualties if we landed on, Iwo Jima, on, on mainland Japan.
Yes, sir. Are those tunnels still there today? Yes, they are. Um, and I've got some pictures of them from back when we could go into them. There's so much shifting now. Um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a Japanese major who got stationed on the island. There's no one living on the island except for a small Japanese force now, and they keep people off the island. So uh, this major wanted to explore the, uh, the, the island and the, and the tunnels, which I gotta tell you, it's, it's really cool stuff. When you get real deep down inside, there's, there's piles of old World War II sake bottles. These guys would get all drunk, and that's when they would do their bonsai charges. So all these sake bottles are still down there. One of the biggest collectible in the Pacific right now. For a sake bottle from World War II, about $1,500. So everybody wants those. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, Japanese, a, Japan is a fairly small island, and its population is limited. How could they, how could they have enough people to put that many on? on uh, At this point in the war, at this point in the war, they were teaching five-year-olds how to fight and, and prepare for the U.S. invasion. They were giving them sharpened bamboo sticks, and that's what we were going to be fighting if we would have landed. You know, thank God that there was never a time that the Japanese saw a single Marine or our, our U.S. soldier kill a Japanese citizen. It, it was a godsend, because when the emperor finally said, that's it, we're done, they laid down their weapons and they, they, they stopped. Um, in Major Rick Spooner's book, um, Tales from an Old Marine at the Bottom of a Canteen Cup, which is a, it's a phenomenal read. Uh, Major Rick Spooner, remember that book. Um, Major Rick Spooner put out three books, but he talks about, he was with the occupation forces in Japan at the end of World War II. The Japanese were saving their best weapons on the island of, of um, Japan for when the invasion occurred. So when they laid their weapons down and they surrendered, they had two to 3,000 Japanese zeros that were in caves hidden. They had never even fired them up yet. So this was, they, these people were gonna fight till the very end. So it was, it was really bad. Um, to show you how bad the casualties were, now you think about a million US casualties for an invasion on Japan. We've gone through Korea, Vietnam, the war, the you know, Desert Storm, we had Afghanistan, we had Iraq. We have not made a single Purple Heart since 1945. We have warehouses that are full of the, of the Purple Heart medal that were made in 1945. We have not made a single, uh, a single medal because we thought we were gonna give all those out to casualties during World War II, which I, I ju that just is amazing to me. That's, that, that's kind of sobering. This here on the left is General Tadamashi Kurbayashi. He was the island, um, the island commander of Iwo Jima. He did not have to be there. He was told to go to the Bonin Islands. He could have gone to the island behind, which is Chichijima. He said, no, I gotta be with my troops. So when he went onto the island of Iwo Jima, he knew he was never coming off of that island. And there's a couple books that I'll, I'll recommend at the end of this if you are interested. One of them, um, Clint Eastwood made a movie about Letters of Iwo Jima. Um, the book that it came from was So Sad to Die in Battle by Kamiko Kakahashi. And she, she put together all of his letters that he had written to his wife. What an incredible man. Because as he's in this fight for his life, before they cut off all of the letters and everything so he could still write back and forth to his wife, he was worried about stuff like the gap underneath the floor because it's gonna get so cold in Japan. I don't want you and the kids to be, to, to be freezing. The, the one man that really helps us keep this island open, and like I said, it's, we get one day a year. Usually it's the third or fourth Saturday of March this gentleman down here is Yashitaka Shindo. He's with the Japanese Diet. He is the grandson of General Tadamashi Kurbayashi. If it was not for him, the island would be completely closed to all Americans. As it is right now, the way the Japanese and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the contract that we have with them, in order to go to Iwo Jima, you have to be an American or you have to be a Japanese citizen. That's it. 
We get calls from people all over the world saying, we want to go to EWO. Sorry, can't help you. Those are the only two citizens that get to go to this island. All right, so the one thing that we do not want is this to turn into one of these things where we're up on the island beating our chests. Hey, we kicked your guys' butts. We, we promised the Japanese at the very beginning of this thing with the reunion of honor, that's not what this was about. This was about honoring both sides because one of these guys that died there could have cured cancer or something like that. So it's a very respectful ceremony. It's joint, we've got the Japanese on one side, we've got the Americans on the other. We meet in the middle, we do a very religious ceremony and then people are able to go walk and, and ponder their own thoughts after the memorial. So it's actually a beautiful experience. Um, we're always trying to figure out ways to stay relevant to the Japanese and help them. So um, this, this picture that we took here, um, this is Colonel Warren Weedhan. He's a Chosen Reservoir veteran. He is also my boss who is funding me coming out here. Um, he is the owner of my company, Military Historical Tours. Um, I, I've had a lot of gentlemen and, and a couple ladies that have asked me, how did you get involved in this? Um, I have no family members that were on Iwo Jima. I'm a Marine. That was, the, that was the draw. When I first got hired by Military Historical Tours, <clears throat> I started taking these veterans back to where they fought during World War II, Korea and Vietnam. And before I knew it, I fell in love with doing this, and I got a call from Major General Fred Haynes, who was the operations officer of Combat Team 28. He was with the 5th Marine Division. He was the intelligence officer who said, hey, we need a flag up on top of that mountain. So he called me up and said, hey, based on all the work that you're doing with the vets, we want you to, to kind of take over as executive director of the Iwo Jima Association. I'm an idiot. So <laughs> I was really questioning his judgment after that. But I did that for 14 and a half years and we kept the island open, we grew the association and um, it, it, you know, I, for, I come from a very, very small town in, in deep south Texas. Uh, my graduating class was 32 people. I graduated top 50. <laughs> I was 31. I was a D and an F student. So for, for me to be up here doing this stuff, um, I'm living the American dream. My mom was Native American and Irish. My dad is Polish. He immigrated at the age of two from Poland. Um, this, I am the American dream. And to be able to, to spend the last 16 years working for my heroes has been amazing. So I took over as executive director and General Fred Haynes at the time said, we gotta figure out a way to make sure that we're relevant to the Japanese. So for the next 14 years, every time we had a reunion with all the Iwo Jima veterans, I printed out these maps and I would give it to them and I'd say, I need you to tell me where you remember there being mass graves. So I did that for 14 years. So this picture right here was we were invited to the embassy there in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., and we were given an International Peace Award. I'm a man of peace. <laughs> like, just call me Shandi. Um, it's incredible to me that, you know, from my humble beginnings, I got that kind of an award because we've helped them collect over 1,500 remains. So that's one of the, the things that I'm most proud of is that no matter what else happens, we repatriated these people. Now, there's a lot of problems that go with that because when the Japanese collect the remains, they pile them up and then they burn them all. And then they take the ashes back to Japan. Anybody see a problem with that? No. We're, we're still missing Americans. Yeah, but. So we've asked them, please, we've got to do some kind of testing and they're not. So, so you don't know. we don't know. We don't know. Um, it's, it's one of those double-edged sword things. So, you know, the, the thing that we do know is that the majority of the Marines that were killed offshore, they're, they're gone. Um, there were some Marines that were drug into the tunnels. 
which we'll talk about a little bit in a, in a minute. There were no tunnel rats during Iwo Jima, in spite of what some people, I've, I've had people that have come to me and told me that their dad was a tunnel rat on Iwo Jima. It's not my place to correct them, but there were no tunnel rats. They blew those tunnels, they stopped those Japanese from coming out or going in. That was it. So, um, this right here are the landing beaches, starting with red. This is where Combat Team 28, the guys that raised the, the flag on Mount Saribachi, that's where they landed. And if you, if you look at some of the pictures of them going up, this was an incredibly steep mountain. It's amazing that they were able to actually hike up this mountain. Um, you then had red beach, yellow, and then blue. Fifth Marine Division was down in this area. Fourth Marine Division here. Third Marine Division was in reserve. After day three, they said, we gotta send in the third Marine Division. So that's when they started bringing them ashore, okay? Um, one of the things that everybody always talks about is the black sands of Iwo Jima. This is one of the terraces. When I first put this together, at that point, General Fred Haynes had passed, and the senior man from the Iwo Jima Association was uh, General Larry Snowden. And General Snowden was a captain on Iwo Jima during the battle. He was with the 4th Marine Division. <clears throat> when he first came ashore, he had been hit. Um, a mortar round exploded right behind him. It blew out his eardrums. Couldn't hear anything. Um, they actually evacuated him to Guam. They, his wounds were not as bad as they thought they were. So they patched him up, they stitched him up, and he goes, how do I get back to the island? And they said, no, 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 we're, we're not letting anybody go back to the island. And he goes, I have to, that's my family. So he actually got back on a plane and was able to get back out to Iwo Jima. He was there about three or four days later. So when he got there, he blew out his eardrums again. But when I first showed him this presentation, um, I was teaching at the time, so when I, when I asked for two weeks off during the middle of the school year, I had to be able to justify why I was doing it. So I did this presentation for General Larry Snowden, and he had told me about when he was a captain, he was yelling at a squad that was up on one of the terraces just like this. And he was yelling, and he could not get them to pay attention to him, so he ran up, and he grabbed one of the Marines by the by the leggings and he started shaking. He was so angry because these guys would not listen to him. And when he, when he was shaking him, the guy just kind of peeled off and rolled down the hill dead. He'd been hit in the head. And as he looked to the right and he looked down the line of Marines that were up on that first terrace, he said he was absolutely mortified. He almost went insane because every single one of those Marines had been hit in the head. Because there were the pillboxes that were up on these terraces. So there was no safe place for these guys to hide. When they got beyond that terrace, the Japanese, after the pillboxes had been cleared, they just came up through the tunnels, which they didn't know there were tunnels. They would just come back up through the tunnels, and then they, so they were completely surrounded. For the entire 36 days of this battle, the Marines were always surrounded. So this was very, very violent. So uh, just to kind of show you, you know, it's easy to describe to people what it's like on Iwo Jima, but this is volcanic ash, and just standing on the beach, you sink up to your ankles. So, um, during this picture here, this is back when I was about 10 pounds um, younger, but um, <clears throat> I've got about 80 pounds of volcanic ash on my back, because we always bring back some of the sands from Iwo Jima. But, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for these guys carrying everything that they owned and they had to fight with. And then imagine being in a crossfire trying to get up these terraces. It's just, you can see how much problem, how many, and there was no way to dig into this stuff. And then compound that with, in order to cook their food, all they would do is dig down about two or three inches, maybe a foot put their can in there and then cover it up and they could literally cook their food right there. That's how actively volcanic this is. So, um, and this is Combat Team 28. By the way, the gentleman who hired me the first time, this is Captain Fred Haynes. So this was all over the Marine Corps Gazette and everything else. <clears throat> when I went back to Iwo Jima for the very first time, 
I've actually got this magazine on my wall at home and General Haynes autographed it for me and everything. So it's one of my cherished possessions. But when I went back, I told him, I said, hey, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna find that exact same spot. So I think I got exactly where those guys were fighting. And one of the, the real clues, so you can see all the vegetation here, that's the original landing beach now. The island is actually lifted 24 feet up into the air now. So it's risen out of the ocean 24 feet. So the original landing beaches, the concentration of fire was so heavy here, when you collect sand from there, you actually have to pull the bullets out because we have to take TSA with us to make sure people aren't taking hand grenades and everything else. They search everybody. So you have to pull out the bullets. That's how heavy of a concentration. Those bullets are still there. When you're walking around there, you still find cartridges everywhere. So it's, it's really kind of the, the neatest place. This is the top of Mount Sarabachi, right where that arrow is, is where they raised the flag. Now, is everybody aware that there were two flag raisings? Okay, everybody know the controversy behind those flag raisings. First flag raising, this is it. <clears throat> this is actually John Bradley right here. John Bradley was the Navy Corpsman. I'm sorry? He's a Wisconsin native. He was a mortician. Refused to talk about the flag raising. Refused to say he was uh, any kind of hero. I gotta tell you, I've worked with a lot of World War II vets. And one of the things that's really sad to me is all of those vets that I started working with 17 years ago, give or take, um, all those guys that were on the board of directors, all those guys that I traveled with and I took back multiple times, they're all gone now, which is heartbreaking. Because, you know, I had, at one time, I had like 50 grandpas. You know, I, if we went to Hawaii together, man, they were trying to find me a wife. It was, it was something, and I gotta tell you, if you can't meet women with a 90-year-old World War II vet, you can't meet women. So it was absolutely the greatest time ever. Um, so the first flag goes up. General Bill, uh, General Rocky, who was the, the division commander for the 5th Marine Division, which if you look at the pictures, there is an actual picture of General Bill Rocky. His son is actually on the board of directors. So Bill Rocky Jr. was actually a Korean War veteran, retired a colonel from the Marine Corps. So it, 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 he's a spitting image of his father. However, so General Rocky says we need a flag up there. General uh, Captain Fred Haynes says, hey, I want you guys to find a flag, get it up there. They take it up, they raise that flag. Now, there's a lot of people that I've talked to, I've gotten two different stories out of this. <clears throat> there are some people that say, oh, the flag went up, everybody started cheering, the, the horns on the ship started honking, everybody was celebrating. That's the first story. The other story that I hear is people going, hell no, nobody was cheering. Everybody was shooting at us. They were trying to kill us the whole time. There was no lull, according to a lot of these gentlemen. So there's, I don't know what happened on that day. Um, what our communications director at the time, his name was si, uh, si O'Brien, little Irishman, about five foot two, barely five foot two. Um, he was a scout sniper on Bougainville, eventually gets into, he becomes a combat correspondent on Guam and on Iwo Jima. On Iwo Jima, he was in his fighting hole, and when he was laying down on his back, completely covered, he could see the top of Mount Sarabachi. And the way he described it is when the flag went up, <clears throat> he couldn't hear anything, but what he saw was this absolutely beautiful red, white, and blue flag going up against this incredibly blue sky. He said it was the most beautiful thing he had seen ever in his life. So, yes, sir. First, first flag was, I think, about three by five. It was, it was, it was small. It, it, it was not three by five. They're both, the, the second one is a little bit um, larger. At the National Museum of the Marine Corps, they actually have both flags and they alternate them coming out. So it's really hard. It's not three by five. It's, it's bigger than that. But um, it was not as big as the second flag. I'll just say that. Okay. So this flag goes up. 
So, second flag raising, this is Joe Rosenthal. Joe Rosenthal missed this event. Joe Rosenthal was 4F. He had bad eyesight. They asked him, you know, hey, we're going to go up there and raise the second flag. When that second flag went up, now the story is that James Forstall, who was the Secretary of the Navy at the time, came ashore and he looked at that flag and he goes, that is the Marine Corps for the next 500 years. That's going to save the Marine Corps. I want that flag. Supposedly, General Rocky said, General Haynes, I, or Captain Haynes, I want that flag. That is the 5th Marine Division flag. You go up there and save it. Now, whether or not that happened, I don't know. However, I do know that Secretary of the Navy Forrestal committed suicide after the Battle of Okinawa <laughs> because he was so guilt-ridden for all the casualties. So that doesn't sound like somebody that was out souvenir hunting to me. Could have been, I don't know. Joe Rosenthal decides, I'm going to go up on the second flag raising. This is the first flag coming down, first, uh, second flag going up. So at the top of Mount Sarabachi, everybody has heard about all of the things over the last five years of them identifying two new flag raising members. John Bradley was not in the second flag raising. He was in the first flag raising. Okay, so this is the first flag going down, second flag going up, and this is the most famous, most reproduced photograph in, in world history. This is the second most recognized symbol in the world. Number one is Coca-Cola. <laughs> so um, this was an absolute accident. So we have uh, one of the historians on our staff, his name is uh, Colonel Dick Camp. He's an author, he's published several books. He was very, very good friends with Joe Rosenthal. Joe Rosenthal, he asked me, he goes, so tell me the story of how you got that picture. He said, well, he goes, it, it, it's kind of a comedy of errors. He goes, I was walking along the landing beaches there on Iwo Jima, and I heard that there was going to be a new patrol going up from Combat Team 28, and they were raising the second flag. So I asked all these other photographers, you guys going up? And they go, no, why? It's the second flag. Nobody cares about that. And he goes, well, I'm still going to go up. So Joe Rosenthal follows these guys up. He gets up there, and he is actually at a lower vantage point up on top of Mount Sarabachi than these gentlemen are. So he gets up there, and he starts taking these huge lava rocks and stacking them up. He gets up there, and he's trying to balance. And, and when he was down on the landing beaches, he had actually dropped his camera in the ocean. So he picks it up, and he's shaking it out, trying to get all the seawater out of it. So he has no idea what shape his film is or anything else. So he's up there balancing, and all of a sudden they say, Joe, the flag's going up. Click. He shoots the, the picture. Doesn't focus, doesn't aim, he just click. That's it. So he goes, you know what? You guys want to be on the cover of the newspaper? Everybody says, yes. So he takes this picture. The title of this picture is called Gung Ho. It is a Chinese word meaning unity. In the Marine Corps, you have to be gung-ho. So he takes this picture. They've identified every single man in this, this picture. He poses it. He gets done because he doesn't know if he's got a photograph or not. He comes down. He, he goes up to one of the, um, the troop transport drivers, and he goes, hey, could you do me a favor and take this out to the UPI office on one of the ships and please deliver this film. <clears throat> he has no idea what he's got. It goes all the way back to Australia, they develop it, and this is what they come up with. He wins the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> he has no idea what picture won the Pulitzer Prize. So he gets off the ship, a troop transport, he goes back to Australia, and people start asking him, because they're like going, Joe, you're going to win the Pulitzer Prize with that. Did you pose that picture? And he goes, well, of course I posed that picture. <laughs> you think it's going to be like just a natural picture? He thought they were talking about this. So there's always been this controversy that he posed that picture. He did not. It was an accident. There's a difference. Okay? So they finally cleared that up. He wins the Pulitzer Prize. Statue is made, and for the longest time, they thought they had everybody identified. General Naylor, who was a commandant of the Marine Corps, about five years ago, comes out 
and orders an investigation. They find out that um, Corporal Schultz is, Harold Schultz is actually one of the Marines and it was not John Bradley. So then all of a sudden there's a bunch of rumblings going on about Rennie Gagnon, who was the company runner. They said, ah. I mean, this is a huge investigation. The FBI were involved. Um, the, one of the historians here at this museum, I walked into his office yesterday, and he actually has the book Investigating Iwo, which if you want a copy of that, all you gotta do is write the, the Marine Corps History Division, they will send you a copy for free, okay? Um, <clears throat> it was actually a guy by the name of Harold Keller. They called him Pie Keller, Pie Killer, because he ate a pie by himself one day. <laughs> but both these guys never told anybody that they were in that flag raising picture. That is the definition of gung ho. They knew the greater good was just to stay, stay quiet. They stayed with their units, they fought, and that was it. That's, that's exactly what they were trained to do. Question, sir? Yeah, do you know what happened to Ira Hayes? Him Ira Hayes um, is this gentleman right here. Ira Hayes goes back. He's, um, he's actually with the War Bond Drive, the 7th War Bond Drive, and um, develops a severe drinking problem. He was, he was American Indian. Right? He, was, um, he was Puma Indian. Okay. Um, goes back to, he actually fell asleep out in a field. He, was, he had passed out. Um, it snowed. He was, um, he was up in Flagstaff, and, and he died from exposure. So very, very sad sad ending for, for Ira Hayes. So, um, so when all this controversy was going on, Joe Rosenthal goes, look, if you don't believe me, ask Bill Janoust. Now, Sergeant Bill Janoust had actually died on Iwo Jima. There was a firefight out in front of a, one of the caves. Um, Bill Janoust actually crept up to the caves, turned his camera light on to to kind of illuminate the Japanese so his platoon could see what was going on. And the Japanese shot him, rushed out of the cave, grabbed him, pulled him into the cave. There's, um, there's an ongoing effort to try to find him and bring him back and bury him in Arlington Cemetery. They can't find his, his remains. They've gone to the, the tunnel and the hill that he was supposed to be in. He's not there. So they don't know if they took him down into a different section. You can't get down into the main tunnels now. So they're collapsing. It's 120 degrees down there. Um, it's, it's horrible. However, if you go to YouTube, you will actually see, if you type in flag raising on Iwo Jima, that black and white film that you see is the work of Sergeant Bill Janoust. And what's amazing about that, he only had 11 seconds of film. And he filmed that whole entire event. Now, how he knew that he needed to save that, that roll of film, I have no idea. But 11 seconds, and he got the entire thing. Probably the most important flag raising in American history. Um, as far as Medals of Honor, out of all of World War II in the Pacific, we had 82 Medals of Honor. To show you how fierce this battle were, uh, was, we had 27 medals on Iwo Jima alone. That, that is absolutely remarkable, okay? The youngest was Jack Lucas. When I first got involved, I actually got to take uh, Jack Lucas back to Iwo Jima one time, <clears throat> and he was a loose cannon. He actually joined the Marine Corps at the age of 14. He was really a big kid. Um, he was always getting in trouble. Mom was yelling at him. She was a single parent, and um, he decided he didn't need school, so he went and he decided he's gonna join the Marines. Shows up at the, uh, the Marine recruiters and they say, yeah, we'll, we'll take you, you gotta be 18. He goes, well, I'm 18. And they go, well, do you have your birth certificate? He goes, well, it's at home, I gotta go get it. So he goes home, <clears throat> he finds his birth certificate and it's got his birth month and day, but they neglected to put down the year. <laughs> so Jack Lucas helped him out. So he puts down the year he is now officially 18 years old as far as the Marine Corps is concerned. He disappears, run away, runs away from home. 
goes, ends up at Camp Tarawa on the big island of Hawaii with the rest of the 5th Marine Division. And Jack is training and they say, hey, everybody needs to write home and just let them know we're going into action. They, they have no idea where they're going, but Jack writes this letter back to his mom full of bravado about how he's going to go kick the world's butt and the Japanese are in trouble now, but don't worry because I'm with the best unit in the Marine Corps. Gets to his mom before he leaves the big island. Mom gets in touch with the Marine Corps and the Commandant of the Marine Corps and says, my son is only 15 years old. He is not going to war. Jack Lucas ends up in the brig on the big island. Somehow, he ends up breaking out of the brig and he stows away with his unit. He ends up stowing away onto one of the landing craft, gets onto the island of Iwo Jima, does not even have a weapon. He's out patrolling with the rest of his unit. <clears throat> a Japanese hand grenade comes out and he immediately, without thanking, dives down on top of it. It's a dud. All of these Marines that he's with are like, you are crazy. And Jack is like, man, I love you guys. You're my family. And these guys were really, really tight. So they go off and they're patrolling again. Another hand grenade comes flying out. And without thinking twice about it, Jack Lucas dives down on top of it. It detonates and it, it basically devastates his entire midsection. He survives. Um, this is Jack Lucas meeting with the Commandant. This is General Hagee from back in the 1980s. So Jack Lucas survived to a ripe old age. He, he and his wife, he, he wrote a book. It's, it's, I, I can't remember the, the name of the book. It has something about um, Superman or something. But um, he and his wife used to argue all the time. And um, they argued up to the point that he actually died. And at one point they were arguing and he just went, <sighs> And he was laying in bed and she started crying. She was so upset. She said, Jack, you can't leave me. And he goes, I'm not gone yet. <laughs> so he opened his eyes, they argued a little bit more, and, and then he had passed within a couple hours of that. But Jack, he was a real colorful person. Um, he had actually, one time, the, the time that I took him to Iwo Jima, he was actually, um, being very derogatory toward the Japanese. And General Snowden walked up and said, Jack, I'm gonna tell you this one time, if you're disrespectful to anybody on that island, I'm kicking you off of the island. And so Jack Lucas was very respectful after that. But it was, it was very interesting. So this was the youngest, <clears throat> the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from World War II and from Iwo Jima is Woody Williams. So Woody Williams is 97 years old, last month, give or take. He actually fell and broke his pelvis. He is on the mend. He was actually the uh, official at the Liberty Bowl Parade, the Grand Marshal. Um, Woody Williams has one of those little slingshots that he tools around West Virginia in. I've now taken Woody back to Iwo Jima four times. If we go in March, Woody Williams is going for his fifth and final time because he's got one grandson who never got to go because he was in college. So Woody is... Uh, is quite a remarkable man. There's lots of um, statistics about the Battle of Iwo Jima, but the one thing that, everything that I've ever read and studied about Iwo Jima, this statistic, I think, says everything about Iwo Jima. During Vietnam, during Korea, during any war, when your unit reaches 15% casualties, they pull you off the line. You are no longer an effective combat unit. The average infantry regiments suffered 75% casualties on Iwo Jima. There's documented cases when these LVTs pulled up onto the island to pull these Marines off, they would have these huge things, you know, like an entire battalion would come in on these things. And then there'd be like five or 10 guys that would walk up onto these, because they, they, the Navy had anticipated it'd be the same amount of guys coming. And they'd get on there and they'd say, hey, where is everybody? We're it. That's how high of a casualty rate this was. Two out of every three in the first, the first hour and a half, two out of every three Marines was a casualty. Um, this is the map that I used to give out to the Iwo Jima veterans so they could identify. 
<coughs> these are some of the remains. We're now at 1,500. Um, so we are actively trying to stay involved with the Japanese to help make it relevant. Um, Yashitaka Shindo, what he would like to do is when the island, when they recover all the remains, which they will never do. Out of 22,000 Japanese, less than 200 survived. Everybody else was killed, okay? Um, they will never recover all of those remains. However, what the Japanese believe is that when they do, then they will make this, an enti this entire island an international peace park, and we will then dedicate it to scholarship and understanding what happened on the island of Iwo Jima so people can actually go and, and really study this. It, it'll probably never happen. It'll probably never happen. Um, some more of the pictures. <clears throat> Every year, like I said, we have the reunion of honor. These are some of the veterans that we've taken in the past. Um, this gentleman here was George Alden. George Alden was John Bazalone's best friend. So I've got back at my house, I've got all kinds of pictures of George Alden and John Bazalone. Right before they had, they had gone ashore onto Iwo Jima, they actually shaved their heads because they didn't know when it was gonna happen. Who's George Bazalone? Uh, uh, George Bazalone, during the Battle of Guadalcanal, fought on the Battle of Bloody Ridge. Um, he was a machine gunner. <clears throat> they estimated he killed single-handedly about 200 Japanese. They, he had piled them up so high with his concentration of machine gun fire that at one point he abandoned his machine gun, ran out into the field of fire, and had to push over the bodies because they had piled up so high. So he was nominated, received the uh, Medal of Honor. He was with the 1st Marine Division. His war was over. He was on a war bond drive. He became a Hollywood celebrity. Um, I think, I'm trying to think of the uh, Hollywood starlet that um, he was having an affair with, but he hated every minute of it because he knew that his Marines were out in the Pacific still fighting and being killed. So he eventually talks his way back in to going back out into the fleet. They put him with the 5th Marine Division, which was put together exclusively for the Battle of Iwo Jima, and he ends up going back to Iwo Jima. He was in the second wave and he was killed at approximately 10 o'clock in the morning. So <clears throat> he received the Silver Star for his action on Iwo Jima. He was a Medal of Honor recipient. He was from Raritan, um, New Jersey. They still do the John Baz Alone Parade every year. And he was an absolutely amazing, amazing Marine. Um, he's the one who got the Marines because when, when the concentration of fire first opened up, John Bazalone was the one who was running around kicking people in the butt saying, you gotta get off the beach. You can't lay here and hide, you're gonna die. So he's the one who got these people up. And once he, once he fell, um, it just traveled up and down the beaches. John Bazalone died. And everybody realized if John Bazalone can die, so can we. So they all got up and they actually started fighting. So that was the catalyst that got everybody going. Um, we usually fly, fly United Airlines. Um, anytime United Airlines can do it, they will bump up all of our veterans to first class. So that's a tough trip for a 90-year-old man. So in order to go from Virginia to Hawaii, you're talking nine hours. From Hawaii to Guam is another eight and a half hours. So this is a long flight. So we try to make these gentlemen as, as comfortable as possible. <clears throat> We've taken back Navajo co uh, code talkers. All of the original Navajo code talkers, I think there's one or two left now. That's it. Um, we're, we're, at the, we're at the end of, a, of an era because these gentlemen are passing very, very quickly. As I said, um, just this picture here alone, there's not a single one of those men that are still with us today, which is heartbreaking. I, you know, I, I taught for 28 years, and I used to tell my students all the time, if you don't get out and, and want, if you really want to meet these guys and you want to see somebody that is absolutely better than who we are today, go meet these guys. Th these guys were supermen, it, it, and yet they didn't beat their chests. I, I was talking to this gentleman here earlier today about the Tuskegee Airmen. We just lost the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, a couple of years ago, we were at a, an event and, and 
all these Tuskegee Airmen showed up. It was a Iwo Jima veterans and, and Tuskegee Airmen. We all got together and there was a big gala out at Camp Pendleton. And I was talking to some of the Tuskegee Airmen and I said, man, I'm so glad you guys are finally being recognized. And he goes, why? And I go, well, you guys are heroes. And he goes, yeah. He goes, and now these are, these are 90 year old men talking to me and they go, um, how many World War II vets have you known? I said, uh, hundreds. And they go, how many of them bragged about what they did during World War II? And I go, none. And he goes, right, because we all just did our jobs. We did what we're supposed to do. The thing that upset them more than anything was that their own community was not studying and telling their story to their own community. And that's the heartbreaking part of this, because man, you know, it's one thing to be a basketball player or something. As an educator for 28 years, I used to watch them put Michael Jordan up on the wall during Black History Month. And I'm like, these kids have got to aspire to more than that. That is, that, there's so many great examples of heroes that these guys could look up to, but we're not doing it. And it's heartbreaking. And especially now, because we're seeing these guys passing and passing and passing. Um, this is me on one of the landing beaches with Mount Sarabachi, the pass in the back. Um, these are some of the caves. We used to be able to go into the caves. These were really well designed caves. Um, <clears throat> they go down very, very deep. You don't go on the steps at all anymore because they crumble. Like I said, um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a Japanese major who went down into the caves, wanted to explore. Passed out from heat exhaustion, it took him three days to find him, and he had basically slow cooked himself. So they wanted to end this entire thing then, and we told him, no, we gotta keep it going, we'll make sure people stay out of the caves, which we have. So I'm the only one going in the caves now. Um, these are sleeping bunks back in these areas. Um, they had, you guys ever wondered where the poles came from? that they raised the flags? Pipe. It was pipe. It was from the, the water cistern that went down into the tunnels. So that's what was left. They had hospitals on there too. Um, so yeah, they had hospitals. They had, yeah, they, they didn't have to come out and fight. Um, <clears throat> two years ago, three years ago, I'm sorry, um, I took Martha McCallan and Donnie Edwards, who was a former NFL linebacker for the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Martha McCallum wrote a book called uh, Unknown Valor, story about her uncle who died on Iwo Jima. We actually put her in touch with the guy that was in the fighting hole with her uncle when he died. I was the technical advisor on her book. I took her to Iwo and it was, it was just a great time, just great time. Um, this is the monument, this is the spot where they raised the flag on Mount Sarabachi. All of the dog tags that you see down here These are all placed there by men and women that are rededicating themselves to the Marine Corps and to the United States. So anybody that ever goes to Iwo Jima, they will take an additional um, pair of dog tags and, and place them up there. So it's, it's a very special place. 2020, March 7th, I had the honor of being a, an invited guest of Woody's when they commissioned his warship. And Woody is just absolutely static. He goes, I can't believe I actually survived Ewo, but then to be able to have a ship named after me, and he, it, it's kind of a really special thing for him. A um, <clears throat> couple books that I'd like to recommend. So this, this blonde haired, he's got, got gray hair now. This gentleman's name is Dan King. He's our interpreter. Blonde haired, blue eyed guy from like Indiana in high school decided he was going to take part in a exchange program with the Japanese. He went, stayed about a month during the summer, started learning Japanese and somewhere along the line he fell in love with the language, fell in love with the culture. He is one of the few people even in Japan that speaks formal World War II 1945 Japanese. Most of the language, language now is slang. So every event that we go to, um, when we go to Iwo Jima, we invite the Iwo Jima Association of Japan. And we, we invite them to Guam, we handle all their arrangements. Um, there is a lottery in Japan. In order for them to go, 
they have to actually win that lottery in order to go. The bereaved families of Iwo, Iwo Jima on, on Japan, these people do not get to go normally. So this gentleman, this old gentleman that's right up here next to Dan King, this was him at 18 years old. <clears throat> at the end of World War II, he was, uh, he was actually wounded on Iwo Jima. They, put him, they took him out to a hospital ship. He became a POW. He actually got home to Japan and when he walked in his front door, he asked where his mom and dad were, and they said, they're at your memorial service right now, they're burying you. He actually had to walk in to the memorial service. There were six Japanese soldiers' pictures up there. He had to tiptoe up there and grab his picture, wave at his parents, and then he snuck away. <laughs> but we actually smuggled him onto the island of Iwo Jima the last time. We, uh, we said he was part of the film crew. <laughs> um, one of the books that I told you about, So Sad to, to Die in Battle, um, this is Kamiko Kakahashi on Iwo Jima. Um, it, Clint Eastwood made the movie Letters of Iwo Jima. This is what that is based on. It is a really a phenomenal read. Um, this is the monument that is on Iwo Jima that is part of the, uh, the landing beach. The side that is facing the landing beach is in English. The side that is facing the, um, the island is in Japanese. So there's all kinds of ceremonies that we do there. It's very, very touching. This is the Japanese side of it. <clears throat> and then the last thing, this is uh, Ivan Hammond. He's one of our board of director members. Ivan Hammond is now 98 years old. Ivan was married to the same woman for over 75 years. And about five years ago, Eileen passed away and he's, he's, he's doing well. He's always talking about how I'm learning to live without my honey. And it was absolutely beautiful. I've been married twice. I'll never get to ma be married to somebody for 75 years. But they, they had, they were, it was just beautiful. At 90 years old, they were still walking around holding hands and kissing on each other. We were constantly telling them, get a room. <laughs> they were absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> and I used, to, I used to show this picture to my students. And Ivan's like one of these really slow talkers. You know, you'd ask, how you doing, Ivan? Well, he's from, he's from Houston. I'm doing pretty good, you know? Still like that today. And all of the vets that I take back to Ewell, I always ask them, could you get me a picture of you back, back in your day? So this is Ivan back when he was 21 years old. He had just gotten off the island of Iwo Jima. He had lost... 15 pounds, weighed 120, 130 pounds. This guy's Hollywood handsome. Yeah. And I used to show this to my students and I'd go, that cute little old man that you guys see, at one point, they kicked the world's ass. These are the supermen that we should be, we should be trying to, to emulate what they did. You know, in the Marine Corps, they always taught us, always leave your surroundings better than they were when you got there. And I don't think we're doing that. I think these guys were the pinnacle of our society. And it's heartbreaking to think that in the next five years, all of these guys are gonna be gone. Out of the crew that I kind of adopted as my grandparents, Ivan is the last one. And, and he's just been diagnosed with dementia. You know, I, I used to always tell my students, and any time I lecture to young people, I tell them, you know what? I would bet from this spot we're in right here, if you were to drive 10 miles in any direction, you could find some retirement homes. And you think about how busy those families must be that they can't visit their, their World War II veteran. I used, to, I used to give extra credit for my students to go and play cards with these guys or these ladies that that were nurses or donut dollies or whatever. Go learn history. The clock is ticking. And if we want to be better, this is, I think, this is where it starts. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.